Thank you. I am very pleased to have been invited to moderate tonight's forum. Each candidate will have one minute to answer questions you and the audience uh, submit. Every candidate will answer every question. The timekeepers in the first role will hold up a yellow card to signify to the candidates that they have 30 seconds remaining and will hold up a red card when it's time to stop. Every aspect of the forum has been designed to be fair to each candidate. In addition, all candidates have agreed to ask their supporters to be respectful of other candidates and the audience and to remain quiet during the forum. I ask you to respect their commitment. You have many important decisions to make by November 4th. Tonight's forum will give you an opportunity to be heard. Now let's begin. So the way this will work is that um, I will pose the questions to the candidates in order alphabetically with each question, but I will uh, move through the alphabet each time. So a different person will answer first and so forth. Um, so I'd like to begin with question number one, and this is actually, as we're waiting for your questions to come in, this is one that was uh, submitted um, by league members or uh, was posted to our website. And this first question will go to Ms. Kim and then we'll move to Mr. Nolte and finally to Mr. Whitaker. Um, this first question, how would you balance the needs of the district versus the needs of the city? Uh, considering things such as cultural tension, public safety, et cetera, especially in the area of the tenderloin. Ms. Kim. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you all for attending the debate today. It's certainly great to be here and to um, all of these um, issues. Um, district 6 is a very diverse district. Um, I do represent the poorest residents of San Francisco. Um, double um, the citywide average of residents live under the poverty line of 20%. And now I also represent the wealthiest zip code in San Francisco as well as of this year. Um, we certainly have a lot to balance, but I find that District 6 really does face citywide issues, whether it is public safety, development, transportation, and, and of course homelessness and public education. Um, District 6 is currently seeing the vast majority of office and residential development in the city. My role has really been over the last four years to ensure that as we grow in our density and our population and employers and residents, that we are ensuring that infrastructure follows that development, whether it is public transit, ministry and safety improvements, um, and of course, um, affordable housing and open space and parks. Um, that is work that continues to need to happen. Um, District 6 still has a, a lot of need around infrastructure, and we continue to work with both the city and developers to ensure that we are meeting the need to build complete neighborhoods. Um, San Francisco has a, is our great is a great city, and because it's a great city, we have a, a very diverse needs, and uh, you know we have a lot of open space uh, elsewhere in San Francisco, but uh, District Six lacks a lot of open space. So uh, one of the things is balancing that. We have a, a very a lot of development currently happening, and particularly in the South of Market area of District Six. And uh, by putting in those developments, uh, we need to uh, ask the developers to give their fair share to for transportation, uh, public for transit, and uh, other uh, services so that we can all have, including schools. Um, I think the thing is, the fair thing to do is to um, look at wh where the revenues are coming and how they're being spent for our district. And hopefully everything will work out uh, the best way we can. I think uh, San Francisco is, again, a great city, but uh, District 6 has a lot of needs and hope those are being met. So I think, <clears throat> I think the interesting challenge for the city is that uh, the, the departments in the city tend to work like fiefdoms. In other words, the planning department's on the page of let's approve more and more commercial development, let's approve more and more housing. It tends to be concentrated in District 6 because we have a lot of, uh, I guess we're, we're wel more welcoming of it because we've had tradi traditionally industrial areas uh, in a lot of our uh, parts of District 6. Uh, the problem is that as we've welcomed uh, all this new development, the city's MTA has actually cut its reduced service, bus service in South of Market, the 12 Folsom bus, for example, no longer runs east of 2nd Street. And I think that's uh, a good example. Parks haven't really kept up. Uh, 
we, we, I think data needs to be put to better use and departments need to work more collaboratively. Uh, data could help show whether or not resources are be di being distributed equitably. And right now I would argue that it's very, uh, there's a big disparity and they're not being distributed equitably. Thank you. All right, um, the second question comes directly from the audience and I will, the, the remaining questions uh, will come from you, but I have room for more so send them in. Um, this next question will begin uh, with Mr. Nolte. What would be your plan for best implementing Vision Zero, the reduction of pedestrian traffic fatalities to zero? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, you know, uh, along the uh, Market and uh, Van Ness corridor, there, uh, our district has a lot, large number of uh, um, fatalities for uh, pedestrians. And uh, obviously there's a lot of things that need to happen. One is uh, the, uh, the cars need to see the uh, pedestrians and bicyclists uh, before they make turns. Uh, there needs to be uh, more, possibly more uh, time given to countdown signals. There needs to be uh, more uh, more planning so that uh, this would uh, some of these safety measures can happen. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, if we have the BRT coming in, um, having people how people can get to the BRT without uh, being hit by a car uh, when they see the train coming. So there's a lot of things that need to be going in. I think uh, maybe on Market Street that we don't have uh, we close it off so it's there's no um, traffic. That would probably be also the best thing. So Vision Zero is very important, I think, to everybody in District 6, regardless of whether you make $15,000 a year or $150,000 a year. A lot of us move to District 6 uh, specifically because it's flat area, very walkable, uh, with decent transit. Uh, we see a lot of folks that are moving into the Rincon Hill neighborhood actually moving from Russian Hill and other parts of town where the homes have lots of stairs and, and seniors can no longer make their way up and down stairs. Police enforcement's the big thing that's lacking. It's been very difficult to get the police to enforce the existing traffic laws. You may have seen in Monday's Chronicle uh, that there was a um, pilot tested at, at Main Street and Harrison Street, which is the corner where I live, and 2nd and Bryant Street, and there are close to 2,000 uh, instances of either blocking the intersection or blocking the crosswalk in a two-hour time span on two days. We really need more police enforcement. Uh, the MTA has done some great work with painting crosswalk stripes, uh, giving pedestrians a, a shot to get out in the, in the crosswalk before the vehicles come through, but we have to do a lot more. The very first hearing I called for at the Board of Supervisors on my first day was a pedestrian safety hearing. We know that the vast majority of um, pedestrian and vehicle collisions are happening in District 6, and San Francisco has the highest rate of vehicle pedestrian collisions in the state of California, and there's a lot that we need to do. But the data also shows that this is an issue that we can solve. Over 60% of our injuries and fatalities happen on 6% of our corridors, and many of those corridors are in the south of market and the tenderloin. So if we are able to invest enforcement and dollars to 6% of our corridors, we can cut our fatalities and injuries by over half. Our office has been working on a number of things. We introduced the Vision Zero resolution earlier this year, again around engineering, education, and enforcement. Our district was the first to pilot pedestrian safety um, improvements on 6th Street, on Market and Howard, and also a pilot bike lane on Folsom Street where we have seen injuries and fatalities. We've also been working on more crosswalks to shorten the blocks in South of Market. We've been doing slower speeds. We've also been re removing parking spots in the Tenderloin um, near the curb out so that pedestrians can actually see out um, into, um, into the intersection. And the, and, and the pilot, Don't Block the Box, um, was something that our office had initiated earlier this year. In one day and two hours, we gave out 102 citations that brought in over $10,000 for the city. And this is the type of work we want to continue. Okay, I want to caution the candidates when it says time's up to... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm up. ...to uh, actually stop. Thank you. Um, the third question will go to Mr. Whitaker first. And from the audience, what are your plans to develop more open space in District 6? Well, the speculators have driven the prices up in many parts of... District 6, uh, looking forward to either existing upzoning or the central SOMA plan, which uh, is going to do further upzoning. So it's actually created this problem of we need more open space. We only have 0.17 acres per thousand residents as of 2010. Uh, 
I think we have to look at city-owned land for both the affordable housing needs and for open space needs. You know, the port owns properties at, uh, for example, Howard Street and Stewart Street next to the Embarcadero YMCA, which is near about 600 kids that spend their weekdays at daycare centers in South of Market. Uh, there's no reason why that triangle shouldn't be turned into an, a playground. It's 4,500 square feet. Uh, it would make a great playground to complement the playground that the community helped build with David Chu's effort at uh, Sue Beerman Park. But it's, it's, it's going to be tough because the property values are, uh, have been speculated to cost so much. Ms. Kim? Um, my first year in office, um, understanding that open space is an incredible need. We have the fewest parks and the smallest parks of any district in the city. We really worked to secure funding for the existing parks that we had. We're able to get the final round of funding for Bodecker Park, the only multi-use park um, in the Tender White, which will be opening next month and is incredibly exciting. We we're also able to secure a million dollars for the South Park Playground and the Turkish High Playground, and we're now working on our second playground, Sergeant McCockley, um, in the area. We were also able to open the Dog and Skate Park under the 101 Freeway. We do have to be very creative about what open space is and where we would look for that. And we've also been looking at our existing space again. Jean Friend Rec Center, the only one in the South Market, it may be hard to expand it, but we're looking at a capital improvement plan to build additional floors, so we're creating more space in the small parcels that we have existing and also looking to acquire another park in the Western Soma area. We've identified a couple of lots. We're going to be using our open space acquisition fund, hopefully, to purchase that one of those sites. Thank you, Mr. Nolting. Um, uh, yes, uh, open space is, has been a long time issue in, San, in, in the um, district. And one of the things I brought up a long time ago when I started seeing uh, developers uh, eating up the various parking lots. Uh, I actually did an online uh, petition and many people saw that that was, that, you know, we have to start educating that when people come along and uh, want to take up all the remaining uh, space that could be open, how, how do you transfer that to possible and maintain it as an open space? Because once you put a building on top of it, it no longer maintain, it's becoming uh, going to be an open space. Um, so really what comes down to is uh, neighborhood planning. We, we seem to not have very good neighborhood planning uh, we allow the uh, planning department and other people to plan our neighborhood, which is not true, not the true way we should be doing it. We, we need more citizen planners. If the citizen planners in our community start speaking out and saying, we need to start planning ahead uh, and uh, looking at these issues instead of um, allowing uh, spot development happening by developers. Thank you. All right. Um, the next question, again, from the audience, um, we'll go first to Ms. Kim. And we don't have all night for this one, just one minute each from, from each of you. Uh, what is your position on Airbnb rentals in the city? Um, this is the issue that's before Land Use Committee today. And I won't speak at length because you can watch our almost eight-hour hearing to hear my comments on this issue. Um, Short-term rentals is something that I think we're hearing from our residents that they would, they would like to see legalized. It is, of course, very challenging. Um, at the point that I'm at right now, we need to create a legislation that is easily enforceable by the city, um, and one um, that we, we have uh, clear factors in which um, to show that this is a short-term rental versus a 365-day hotel business. Um, I'm looking at something with a clear number of nights, hosted or no hosted, um, preferably at 90 days, and also ensuring that our planning department actually has the staffing and the budget it needs and able to um, enforce this very important issue. And we need to keep our neighborhoods residential, and we need to make it clear what is a commercial business activity um, versus something that you're doing part-time to showcase your city um, a couple of nights a week, a couple of um, months out of the year. Thank you, Mr. Nolte. You know, uh, when a uh, management company uh, decides to uh, uh, rent to a, an individual, they usually presume that it's for the individual. And when somebody comes along and, and starts changing the lease agree agreements, uh, there's, that causes a problem. And whether or not that is in their lease or not. So I think the first issue is, uh, Will the city be able to uh, pass legislation that can uh, change the terms of a lease and whether or not the management will be able to approve that? Uh, I think uh, what was just mentioned that, uh, uh, night, that the number of nights uh, that, or a, a, that a tenant can uh, sublease would be, uh, would be good, but not to make it into a commercial uh, bed and breakfast kind of situation. Uh, because then it's no longer uh, under the tenant's name. It's more or less a uh, bread and breakfast kind of situation. And I think that that's not um, the best way that we need our, um, 
or housing stock to be used. Thank you. So for Airbnb, I, I totally support single family homes being allowed to rent on a short term basis, but that's really it. Uh, the problem with Airbnb is it's going to turn, it's, it's going to make apartments more expensive. What I heard from public comment on Monday at the Board of Supervisors uh, committee meeting was folks renting four bedroom apartments, and we don't have a lot of four bedroom apartments, right? Three bedroom apartments, and then renting out the other three bedrooms, uh, that's a family's home potentially. And, and that's being taken off the market, from what I could tell, for, for renting. Uh, we have Megan's Law to inform people when someone who is a sexual predator is living in a building. Uh, this kind of throws out the usefulness of Megan's Law out the window. I, I'm on an HOA for a 288-unit building, and uh, we absolutely uh, fiercely guard against uh, folks using Airbnb in our building, and I hope that we stick with the 30-day minimum for multi-unit buildings. Thank you. Um, question number five will go first to Mr. Nolte. Um, how do you plan on responding to the changing transportation needs of your district? Um, transportation has been a key issue, uh, even though we have uh, some cores corridors for transportation already in existence. We need to have uh, transportation that crosses our district, not just down the, the major corridors. Uh, we need to keep maintain our uh, transit link points, uh, which is very important. So uh, when, you remove the, when the city's deciding to remove bus stops, that they realize that uh, people um, do take those buses uh, or transit uh, um, transit uh, situations. So I think that a lot of times we have people at City Hall making decisions for us, but they're not, ma uh, the neighborhood needs to be part of that planning process. If the neighborhood is part of the planning process, then uh, we would have better transportation. And I think also a lot of it comes down to maintenance of, of Muni as well as uh, uh, the, the fares. Uh, this generates the, the, um, the uh, how to keep it going. Thank you. So I think, I think transportation is the big issue for District 6 uh, besides affordability. And the reason is that all this housing has been built, but like I said earlier, transit service has actually been reduced in District 6 in, in some cases. And, and it, I mean, the, we were, the debate to extend the height limits in District 6 to 400 feet, 500 feet, 600 feet for residential towers is that, that it would be transit-oriented districts. A transit-oriented district, very green, people would walk and ride the bike and take a bus. Um, the problem is if they reduce bus service, what are folks left to do? They're getting trained to drive a car, which adds to traffic congestion. Traffic congestion creates air pollution. Air pollution kills 7 million people per year. That's twice as many people that get killed per year, according to the World Health Organization, from diabetes. I know we're talking about a, a sugar tax this November. Uh, air pollution kills 7 million people a year. And I think that's a lot more important. I would like bike lanes to extend to the waterfront. Right now they stop at 4th Street on Folsom. And I think that's ridiculous when the bike share bicycles are on the waterfront. Thank you. Ms. Kim? So um, as our district grows in workers and residents, and we're certainly already experiencing the congestion that we see today, um, as Jamie said, transportation is going to be one of those key issues. One of the reasons why I took pedestrian safety on is that if we want more people to get out of their cars, they need to feel safe walking in our district and, of course, biking in our district. So the pedestrian safety improvements that I talk about are incredibly important to make our neighborhoods more walkable. South Market was previously an industrial neighborhood with lots of car lanes and very narrow sidewalks, and we have to change that type of structure. Um, more bike lanes. We know that actually the number one way to get people off out of their cars is not Muni, it's actually on their bike. Um, so separated bike lanes, um, something that we've been pushing on 2nd, 6th, Folsom and Howard is something that we're looking at. DTX, Caltrain extension, um, along with Central Subway will be really important um, connections um, for the South of Market area, along with um, something that our residents have been pushing along with Jamie, is making sure Muni goes past Second Street, that we don't just view it as something that's going to the downtown core, but acknowledge the residents that leave live um, east of 2nd Street. And finally, looking at congestion pricing and demand management in the South Market. All right, question number six will go to, we'll begin with uh, Mr. Whitaker and this question again from the audience. Uh, the California, <clears throat> excuse me, Public Utilities Code allows local jurisdictions to exercise, quote, reasonable regulation, end of quote, of CPUC regulated services such as ride shares. 
do you see a role for local government in regulating those services? Absolutely. I, I absolutely do see a, a need for local regulation of the so-called ride-sharing services or illegal taxis. Uh, taxi cab industry has been negatively affected and, and we depend on the taxi cabs, especially to provide those with disabilities, wheelchairs, uh, a, a transportation op option. And if our taxi service uh, dies in San Francisco, it's going to be that much harder for people in wheelchairs to get around. Uh, the question of insurance, uh, is it just, or do people have the proper amount of insurance? Is it commercial insurance that they're carrying? Or is it just their personal insurance with maybe $100,000 liability? Uh, that's, that's probably not enough. Uh, to what extent we can lobby in Sacramento and change laws so that we can regulate the ride-sharing services, we should do that. San Francisco certainly lobbies in Sacramento to get laws changed all the time. Phil Ting and, and getting the arena approved for a use on top of a pier. Uh, as an example, uh, we, we do need to regulate this, this industry. Thank you. So the, state's, the state constitution is unfortunately very clear that any other transportation services other than taxi cabs are regulated by the state um, CPUC. And this started back from the railroad industry days um, from the early 1900s. Um, it's been quite unfortunate because we already have had um, a lot of injuries and some fatalities that have happened here um, here in San Francisco, including one in our district on New Year's Eve where a young six-year-old girl was hit by a driver who was in between passengers, um, and it became very clear that we didn't know whose insurance was going to cover um, this fatality. Um, insurance is really the top issue that we need to manage. Currently, they are debating that at the state level, and I would love to take that on at a local level, but we would either have to redefine what taxi cab service means, or we would have to ask the state to give us that authority. Um, but finally, I would just like to say, the airport um, has been taking this issue on. They are um, stopping um, rideshare services from coming there because they do have some um, of that jurisdiction and that arena. Um, but here at the local level, I do think we need to be more realistic about what it means for the taxi cab industry in order to survive, given the ride share that we're seeing. Uh, ride shares have been a, a big issue, uh, and especially in San Francisco, because of the fact that uh, taxis now um, are uh, not able to do some of the things they were doing before ride shares, which was to uh, deal with. Uh, they were more interested in dealing with, they were able, because of they were getting a lot of revenue, they were able to deal with disabled uh, services, and now they're getting less uh, revenue. They, they have a hard time meeting up with the, the needs of the disabled because they're now being asked to do more for the disabled uh, because uh, the, uh, obviously, ride shares are not picking up the slack. Um, I think that uh, there, that makes an inequitable uh, service in San Francisco, and uh, rates and, and licensing and uh, insurance are all big issues. And of course, uh, lobbying uh, the state to uh, to put some pressure on um, how to do it so it is equitable. Uh, and I think that uh, obviously the uh, um, taxi services have been really uh, crippled by this uh, new uh, system. Thank you. Question number seven will go first to Ms. Kim, and this question is, what are your top three priorities as District 6 Supervisor, and please limit yourself to three. Um, my top priority, and probably what I spent over 70% of my time on, is land use and neighborhood planning. Um, as I had mentioned before, the vast majority of commercial and residential development is happening in our district. And we want to make sure that as we do that, we're building complete neighborhoods and smart growth areas. Um, my second area, um, a priority, has been pedestrian safety and Vision Zero, and I've articulated um, some of our priorities in that arena prior. Um, and the third area is homelessness. Um, we have quite a bit um, of folks that unfortunately live on our street, and they are my constituents as well. Um, I actually decided to go through the homeless um, shelter system myself. My first night as acting mayor, I spent a night um, in one of our shelters in the Tenderloin and learned a lot in that night. A, we have minimum wage staffing um, that doesn't have the capacity to deal with the residents that are coming in. Second, our homeless population is a lot older than we think it is. The average age is in their 40s and 50s, and our shelters were built really for people who are young and maybe just down and out of their luck. We've been pushing for a 24-hour medical respite shelter and also for nurses to actually rove our shelters in the evening to actually address some of the health issues. Um, first uh, priority I have is uh, accountability. Uh, we need to uh, review the nonprofits that we provide funds to. 
And we also need to look at where the money is going, uh, not only to the nonprofits, but also the other services that we fund uh, through the city budget. Um, I think accountability and a reviewing of the, the, the funds is very important. Second uh, is, for me, is uh, public safety. I think that uh, safety has always been a big issue in District 6 and continues, uh, whether it has to do with crime or it has to do with pedestrian safety or it has to do with personal safety or it has to do with uh, just safety in general. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, having public, uh, having uh, the police do uh, more, uh, um, uh, policing, uh, community policing would help with that. And then the last is affordable housing. I think affordable housing uh, that's affordable for, um, in this case, the low income, which is usually now being left out in the current um, types of developments being uh, put together by the uh, city. So my top, top three issues would be focusing on community health in District 6, making sure that we get our fair share, uh, that we're treated equally as other more mature neighborhoods in the city are treated, and taking better care of our kids. Uh, there's a lot of children that are living in the high-rise buildings, believe it or not, and there's a piece of land in Mission Bay that's just waiting for a school to be built. Uh, unfortunately, we see a lot of young families moving out of our, out of our buildings as the kids are turning four, five, six years old uh, because they're, we're just not meeting the needs for parents uh, who desperately want to live in the city and live that livable, you know, the, the sustainable lifestyle. Uh, community health, what I'm really referring to is uh, we need to a attack traffic congestion because it causes air pollution. We have the worst air pollution in, in the city. Uh, it, we also ha we have the most number of hospitalizations of kids suffering from asthma attacks in the city, mostly along the Embarcadero, Treasure Island. Uh, we have to stop building buildings if it's making people's health worse and decreasing their lives. Thank you. Um, the next question uh, will go first to Mr. Nolte, and it is, what would you do to preserve and increase the gay business environment in Western South of Market and the Tenderloin? Um, I think uh, any cultural, um, uh, the, the gay community is, is, a, is a cultural part of San Francisco. And uh, we, ha we used to have a lot of more bars in both uh, South to Market and as well as the Tenderloin. And I think that uh, trying to um, open some more establishments, uh, uh, because obviously what's happened now is uh, the, the uh, businesses are not as, uh, I mean, we used to get a lot of people coming to from the surrounding Bay Area to come to the, uh, the businesses. Um, I think there are also, since a lot of the, like the, the museum and other things are in other districts, um, I think that uh, we need to um, identify the uh, various uh, um, historical p parts that are in District 6 uh, that, um, that identify the, uh, the LGBT community and, uh, put that, and, and put that on the map and keep that on the map in everybody's forefront uh, and put resources uh, for that. I think that a lot of that's been left out and it needs to be looked at. Thank you. So I think, I think uh, there's two communities really in, in Western Soma that have been affected by gentrification. Uh, there's the LGBT community that's certainly been affected, uh, but there's also the, the Filipino community, uh, which uh, still treats, treats the area as a, a cultural focal, focal point uh, with community centers and, and St. Patrick's Church. Um, but it's, it's a problem that, uh, that, that affects more than just the LGBT community. I, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of, even the Castro, a lot of folks are saying, there goes the gayborhood. Uh, but they're, they're doing a good job of marking the redesign of Castro Street with rainbow uh, flags and so on is helping. I think Western Soma has a cultural heritage district for both the LGBT community and the Filipino community and we need to make sure that's funded. We produce a lot of revenue for the city and south of the market, and there's no reason that those uh, things shouldn't be funded now to, to provide, similar to Castro Street, a uh, marker of those communities in Soma. When people think of the LGBT community and LGBT history, they often think of the Castro neighborhood. But I'm really proud to represent a district that has also had a really strong history and community um, L of LGBT businesses um, and community leaders, um, both in the South Market and in the Tenderloin. I got to come in at the tail end of the seven-year Western Soma community planning process, which 
came out of our neighborhood, led by our neighborhood leaders. And what came out of that process was ensuring that we would, in the future, um, have a leather LGBT social cultural district, um, as well as a Filipino social cultural district in Western Soma. I've been working really hard to make sure that we are preserving and supporting our LGBT businesses, particularly entertainment, along the 11th Street corridor. Um, when, Eagle, when the Eagle was sold, making sure that it was sold to another LGBT owner that would respect that history and continue on that tradition. And in the Tenderloin, we've had um, a strong um, LGBT community as well, particularly the T, uh, the transgender community that has found um, the Tenderloin both to be affordable and a safe haven. Um, we actually did the first trans uh, transgender street naming in the Tenderloin, Vicki Marlene, and was excited to do that and to do more. The uh, next question, question nine, will go first to Mr. Whitaker, and it reads, homelessness issues in the open space near Civic Center BART station and in UN Plaza are escalating. What compassionate solutions do you have to manage this area? So I, I work at City Hall, so I come up out of the uh, escalator by Burger King every day, um, and, it, and it, you can actually you can certainly tell a difference uh, in the enforcement measures that the BART uh, district has been has been taking. Uh, no longer uh, am I walking to work and, and the hallway filled with folks uh, sleeping. I, it puzzles me why why our, our BART stations are still so large to begin with, and and I think the compassionate use of all that space might be to allow some sheltering of folks, especially when, when there's inclement weather. Uh, our stations are huge compared, think of New York uh, and, and, and look at our stations, it's, it's quite different. Uh, the number one thing we have to do is we need to build more housing, uh, such as the Rene Casanave apartments on Folsom Street at Essex that houses now 120 formerly homeless people. Uh, we, need, we need to get folks housed, but uh, it needs attention always. So today I actually had the opportunity to visit our um, sobriety center and our medical respite shelter on Mission and 8th Street. Um, and it's something that I've been looking to expand. I had mentioned before, we treat homelessness like it's purely an economic issue. Um, you're down in your luck, you're out of a job, and you need a place to stay um, for a couple of months, a couple of weeks um, to get your feet back up. But what we look at when we see the demographics of our homeless populations, we have a lot of folks with physical disabilities, with mental health disabilities, um, those that are veterans that have um, PTSD, um, and that we really need to make sure that, again, we have nurses um, that are in our shelter systems and roving, and that we actually have a 24-hour medical respite. Um, that's what we're working on right now, to open a 24-hour medical respite shelter in Western Soma. So when we have a homeless outreach team go out, they're not just shuffling people from one corner to the next, but they're actually bringing someone to a place where they can get counseling and medical services on site. There are a lot of needs uh, that the homeless have, and um, obviously housing is one of them. Uh, in other words, the many services that they need, uh, the hot, hot team needs to be reaching out to them. Uh, one of the specific also needs is um, medical services because if they're out there during uh, the, the winter, um, they need blankets, and uh, they need also um, hot meals uh, to keep them uh, to survive over the, 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 the the weather. Um, there are also is safety issues and they also need to have uh, safe injection sites. Uh, this is something that's been talked about for some time and hasn't uh, yet uh, transpired in San Francisco is uh, safe injection sites. Um, I think that a lot of things that um, services that need to um, happen um, haven't yet happened uh, and uh, um, they need to be talked about and uh, made more uh, fail, uh, happening to the population, especially uh, more services for uh, runaways and uh, um, vets. Thank you. Okay, we're getting close to the end, so I'm going to double up a couple of questions here that can really be answered quickly. They're quite different, though. So beginning, and this first one will go to Ms. Kim. The first question, there are two of them here. So um, how did you get to tonight's meeting? And secondly, the Warriors at Piers 3032, was that a missed under? Missed opportunity. Answer as quickly as you can. I took the 14 mission to get here. Um, and uh, Pier 3032, was it a missed opportunity? It was a very challenging site, um, as many of you know. A lot of transportation issues. It's a very enclosed um, site. 
three sides by water, only one with land. But it certainly was um, a, a very exotic site for the Warriors Arena. I do think Mission Bay, though, will be a much easier site for us to be able to work out. I think the biggest issue, which was the transportation um, management need. Um, how do we get bikes, um, Muni, uh, BART, um, but also um, cars in and out of that neighborhood. And I think that we will certainly have an easier time doing that um, in Mission Bay. And also, Mission Bay is a growing neighborhood. It's one that we certainly have more residents moving into. South Beach was already a fairly formed community and would have really had to adjust both of the Giants Stadium and the Warriors Arena um, side by side. Okay, um, the first uh, issue was uh, how to get here. I walked, um, and I think everybody should learn how to walk if they haven't. Uh, and uh, then the, uh, the idea of the, uh, the issue of the uh, any sports arena, I think that anytime you put something into a neighborhood, uh, there needs to be a planning process. And I think that was what really came out of the whole scenario was um, instead of somebody just saying, okay, City Hall, let's do this here, that the community needs to have input. And that's what happened, that the community gave a lot of input and said, well, let's do it someplace. And they came up with a second location, which was probably far better. Thank you. Uh, so I, I just live seven blocks away at Main Street and Harrison Street, so I walked um, and, and certainly support folks walking as much as possible. Uh, the Pierce 3032 location of the Warriors Arena was problematic from the start because of traffic uh, problems that already exist. Uh, the Bay Bridge is a magnet for, you know, at 5 o'clock, everybody's ready to, to head back to the East Bay where most of our affordable housing in the region is located. And, and so we already have a traffic conundrum on Embarcadero, on Harrison, on Bryant, uh, and adding an influx of folks that are coming for uh, events other than basketball games where they're not coming here regularly and they're not familiar with what how our roads work would have been a big mistake. Uh, again, air pollution from traffic congestion is decreasing, peop is decreasing people's lifespans. We need to address this. The planning department needs to stop approving more projects until we address the community health issues which are very negatively impacted by what's already been approved. About four million square feet of office space is gonna be built. That brings more cars. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, question number 11. This will go first to Mr. Nolte. How do you plan to address affordable housing while living in a district with such great income disparity? Well, I think the first issue, what is affordable? So. Affordable for, for whom is uh, the, the key issue, and uh, um, if the average, uh, if we have, if, if it's a, you know, if, if it's 120 percent of uh, medium income, um, there are places being built for that. If it's people that don't have 120 percent of medium income, then uh, we have to find um, um, new housing being built for those individuals, and I think there's a lack of that being happening currently. So. Um, it's a buzzword to say affordable, and I think uh, we need to, to uh, we need people to actually own homes. That's the only way you get out of this cycle. Of um, we need people to start. Own, they get a lot of tax breaks to own homes, and I think that's what's more important is to get people to be homeowners. And uh, so we should be working on that. Thank you. Uh, here, here in South the Market, we're doing something fantastic in the Trans Bay Redevelopment Project area that was approved in 2005. The state gave us lands along Folsom Street that used to have the Embarcadero Freeway, and they required that of the housing built in that area, 35% must be affordable housing. So we're going to have 3,000 units of housing built, most of it high-rise, very fancy luxury housing, maybe $2,000 per square foot. But 1,000 of those 3,000 housing units will be targeted for folks that are making around 80 grand or less. I think most of it's actually targeted about 55% of the area median income, so say $50,000. And we really need that if we want to have folks that work at the hotels, uh, work for Muni and, and other, the, the service industry, not everybody has a master's degree in computer programming, and they deserve to live here too. For the future areas outside of the redevelopment project, um, I, I think Supervisor Kim brought forward a very good idea to limit market rate development until the affordable housing developed uh, gets built or, and let the developers figure it out. They make a ton of money in San Francisco. Ms. Kim? So 60% of our residents qualify for affordable housing here in San Francisco. And as Jamie Whitaker said, you know, if you make 
$550 a year or less, you qualify for affordable housing. And we are clearly not meeting um, that need today. Um, looking at a couple of different things, one, we have been fortunate to have redevelopment up until two years ago, whether it was the Yerba Buena plan, Mission Bay, Trans Bay, which was 35% affordable, or the so South Market plan. We were able to build a number of affordable housing units through that. Now that we, ha we no longer have redevelopment as a tool, we need to oh, look at other sources. I was very surprised to see uh, the time up. Um, looking at um, tiered developer fees. If you're building a luxury condo on the waterfront or a 20-unit building in, in the Excelsior, you shouldn't have to pay the same off-site fee. We should look at tiered fees based on the value of the property that you are building. Um, looking at a luxury tax on first sales of condos um, and also looking at um, a bond um, potentially for 2015. We know that we need both the city to give more and developers to give more if we're going to be able to meet the affordable crisis here in San Francisco. Go. All right, we've gotten through all but two of the questions, but we really need to wrap up now. And it's uh, time for the candidates' closing statements. But let me first remind you that if you're not registered to vote, please do so right away and urge others you know to register. The last day to register for the November election is October 20th. And if you've moved, you need to register again at your new address. Voter registration material is av available in the back of the room for your convenience. We'll now do the closing statements in reverse alphabetical order. And remember that you have one minute. So Mr. Whitaker, you'll go first, then Mr. Nolte, and finally Ms. Kemp. OK, thank you. Um, well, thanks so much for hosting this forum. I think it's been very valuable for everybody. Uh, I think District 6 needs to be recognized as the economic engine that it is for San Francisco. Uh, we represent 20% of the taxable property values in San Francisco. That means the $500 million transportation bond, Measure A, we're going to be carrying 20% of the load, or $100 million, and we need to be treated fairly. Uh, we, need, we need to be treated uh, equally with other districts, and, and that's one of the reasons I'm running. We need to treat our kids better. Uh, there's an awful lot of kids in District 6, and there's no playgrounds, so you don't see them and know that they're out there. That would give the opportunity for folks from different socioeconomic backgrounds to be able to meet each other. And I think that would be really helpful in, in, in building community. We need to be ready for an earthquake. Folks don't know each other. They're not going to be as helpful to each other. Um, and we've got to tackle the community health issues I mentioned earlier. I think development should not be concentrated all in District 6 when it's starting to hurt our health and, and shorten people's lives. Uh, thank you for attending uh, the tonight's meeting or event. Uh, the main reason why I'm running f for District 6 supervisor is the uh, lack of accountability for the working class individuals uh, who pay taxes yet receive none of the services that come with accountability. This is a group that has been excluded in the mix when it comes to having a voice. They are the best beset with high rents, uh, poor muni transportation, random crime, poor education, cuts in health services, and above all, the lack of voice in City Hall. In addition, senior citizens have for, been forgotten altogether. Uh, I am a longtime tenants' rights activist, a civil rights activist, a neighborhood leader, a social justice organizer, and a small business advocate. I am running for District 6 uh, supervisor to bring accountability and representation on your behalf. I ask for your vote on November the 4th. Thank you. Uh, it's really been an honor to um, serve and represent this district um, for the last four years. It's certainly one of the most exciting and dynamic parts of our city. And it's really been amazing to be able to help build and shape the future of what San Francisco neighborhoods look like. You know, when I ran four years ago, people said I would need three or four different platforms representing such a diverse constituency, whether it is our poorest residents um, to some of our wealthiest residents. But when I went door knocking in our condos and our SRO hotels, what I found is that people wanted the same things. Cleaner streets, safer neighborhoods, stronger schools. And so our goal um, over the last four years, and hopefully the next four, is to make District 6 healthier, stronger, and safer than when we left it. A big part of that is building our community, but also our capacity and working on issues that bring our SRO tenants, our Filipino, working class Filipino and Latino families, and our condo homeowners together, whether it's around pedestrian safety or making sure that we have more parks in our neighborhood. Finally, um, supervisorial race is not the only thing on the ballot this year. We hope you also look at our propositions. There are three that I'm really working on. CJK 2014, the Children's Fund, um, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, and of course, affordable housing, CJK 2014. Um, we hope that you all vote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
and thanks to the candidates. And before uh, we proceed further, uh, Jill Fox from the Department of Elections is here to tell you everything you need to know in two minutes about ranked choice voting, which you will have to do for this race. Welcome. Yeah, please. Um, hi, good evening. Um, San Francisco, by law, uh, elects its, most of its local uh, officials through ranked choice voting. Uh, we voted on that, and now we do it, and we've been doing that for 10 years in San Francisco. However, people still need uh, a reminder each election how you do it. Candidates in the ranked choice contest, which are the Board of Supervisor races in 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10, and as well as assessor recorder and public defender, will be elected using ranked choice voting. Their names will appear in three columns. And we want you to vote uh, for your first choice in the first column, and then it will count. In this particular race, there are four candidates that will appear on the ballot. So you will have your full three choices. In the second column, mark your second choice uh, for supervisor. And in the third column, mark your third choice supervisor. If for some reason you only want to vote for one candidate, just mark them in the first column and leave the other ones blank. That way the machine knows how to read your ballot. Don't mark all three choices on the first column, like one, two, three, because neither the machines that we use to read your ballot nor the humans who will go along and read them afterwards will know which candidate you wanted if you voted three times in one column. There are some races um, in the city where there are not enough candidates um, if, to rank your choices. Um, so if there are fewer than three candidates, you can just leave the second and third columns blank on those as well. We have all of this information for you as well as all the key dates and all the information about all of the local uh, measures. We have 12 measures uh, locally to vote on. You will find them in your voter information pamphlet that will be mailed to you um, in about two weeks. It's some fascinating reading. It's 224 pages long, so we all have plenty to do this fall. Um, you can also check it online at sfelections.org. Come by City Hall and we can help you in person. Uh, we just want you to be a voter. For those of you here this evening, I have information at the back I'm happy to share that gives you a nice overview in one piece of paper about what's on the ballot. Um, and of course, be sure to be a voter. Keep your registration up to date. And we um, hope to see you out on November. University, uh, the American Constitutional Society, Golden Gate University Student Chapter, and our media sponsor, San Francisco Government Television, our thanks to the candidates for participating. And thanks to each of you for taking this time to inform yourself about your choices for the District 6 uh, supervisorial election. Uh, we would also like to remind you about the League of Women Voters' upcoming Candidates Meet and Greet, in which all candidates for the Board of Supervisors and State Assembly um, were invited to a social evening with the community. I don't have a date here on my script, but it would be at the League of Women Voters' um, website. We hope that you will join us now for a short reception hosted by the American Constitutional Society. Um, good evening and have a safe night.